All right, if you have your Bibles open now to Daniel chapter 2, let me give us a running start, and then we'll read starting at verse 31. The first half of Daniel chapter 2 that we talked about last week had to do with a dream that King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had that was so troubling to him that it woke him up in the middle of the night and he couldn't go back to sleep. So he calls for his advisors and counselors to come because he wants help un- interpreting this troubling dream. So he calls upon what the Bible refers to as his astrologers, sorcerers, enchanters, all around, quote, wise men. Now, these were men who were specifically trained and tapped into the demonic, and they used incantations, and they used certain ways of tapping into the demonic to try to decipher and discern things, and Nebuchadnezzar turns to them for an interpretation to his troubling dream. Only there's a twist. When he, when he gathers some of them together in his chambers, he tells them not only does he want the interpretation, but he wants them to tell him what his dream was. And they, in a very respectful, royal kind of way, push back and say, you're crazy. You know, I mean, if you don't tell us at least what the dream is, how can you expect us to interpret it? And Nebuchadnezzar's like, this is, this is going to separate the men from the boys. That's why. Because you guys are either, you're legit, you got some street cred, or you're, or you're not. And so, you're going to tell me what the dream was and the interpretation, or I'm going to cut you into little bits and I'm going to burn your house down. They couldn't do what he was asking, so he made kibbles and bits out of them and uh, burned down their houses, and then he sent messengers to kill all the wise men in Babylon. Among the wise men of Babylon are Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Because even though these four guys were faithful to the Lord, they didn't tap into any of the demonic stuff that the other astrologers and enchanters did, Nevertheless, they were in the category of wise men because after they had been taken captive in Jerusalem, these young Jewish men were trained in the ways of the wise men in the areas of literature and language and and all of the Babylonian culture to prepare them to serve the king. So because they're in the category of wise men, they were on the hit list too. And so when Daniel finds out that he's going to die along with the other wise men of Babylon, he appeals to King Nebuchadnezzar himself. And Nebuchadnezzar, because God has made Daniel favorably disposed to his leaders, Nebuchadnezzar gives Daniel extra time. And Daniel goes back home to his dorm room where his three roommates are and says, guys, because about this time they're about 18 years of age. He says, guys, we got to pray. We got to pray. We got to figure out what the dream is and what the interpretation is, or we're going to die with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So this, is, this is amazing because, you know, any point in life, we should be people who recognize prayer not as a last resort, but as a first line of defense. But what is particularly amazing is that these guys are 18. These guys are young teenagers living in a foreign land, foreign culture, foreign language. They've been stripped of everything familiar and comfortable, but they rely on the Lord. And they, even in their, you know, teen years, are saying to each other, we got to seek the face of God. And that's exactly what they do. And when they do, God reveals to Daniel what the dream was and its interpretation. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So Daniel then asks the chief of the eunuchs, can I go back to King Nebuchadnezzar and tell him what his dream was, and I've got the interpretation too. By the way, between when Daniel does that, And when God answers Daniel's prayer, in Daniel 20, verses 20 to 23, is just this beautiful section of praise. We closed our service last week looking at that. It's just a good reminder to us, friends. When you spend time praying and asking God for something, be sure that you follow up with praising Him. We are quick to pray. As soon as we get some answer, off we go, and we forget God. Daniel took time to praise his God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, And then he asked permission to go to the king and to tell him. And that's where we are here in chapter 2, verse 31, down through verse 45. Daniel speaking here in verse 31. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. He's telling Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you and its form was awesome. 
This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and, and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever." Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. We'll pause there and pray and then we'll discuss all this today. Let's pray first. Father, thank you for your great love for us and for your word. And we pray that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart that would receive what you would want us to glean today from Daniel chapter 2. And we thank you for your love and your word. And we hold it dear to our hearts, not just for information, but to live it out. And we thank you together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. If you uh, were around, this is a little before my time, but in 1958, the number one hit song of the day was by the Everly Brothers, All I Have to Do is Dream. Remember that song? Dream, 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 dream when I want you. Okay, how many of you remember that song? All right, look around. This is, these are the people who lived in the time of innocence. 1958. There's actually a lot of songs about dreams. 1973, Aerosmith. Steven Tyler, dream on, dream on, dream on, dream your dreams come true. How many of you remember that song? All right, now look around. Those people did drugs in the 70s. That's uh, <laughs> it's a set. I, you know, every time I do that, you forget I'm going to say stuff like that. But that's because you, you did drugs in the 70s. So you're not prepared again to get slammed for that. But anyhow, uh, dreams, scientific uh, Information about dreams goes like this. They're not only common to every human being, they are necessary for maintaining adequate mental and emotional health. If someone is deprived of REM sleep, the rapid eye movement, uh, it can lead to some serious physiological complications. In the book, uh, Scientific Study of Dreams, the author G. William Domhoff tells us that most people over the age of 10 typically have four to six dreams per night. According to a study about 10 years ago in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, 56% of Americans believe that their dreams reveal meaningful hidden truths, 56%. And there's some truth to that because not only are there natural dreams that all of us have, there are sometimes supernatural dreams that God can give a person. In fact, in the Bible, there are more than 100 specific references of dreams that God has given to people as a means of communicating with them. This is one of those times. Here in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He does not know this is a dream from God, but it is. And 
In the course of this dream, God is going to reveal to Nebuchadnezzar a little bit about himself, God about himself. And also in the course of the dream, God is going to reveal to Nebuchadnezzar a little bit about the present and a lot about the future. Now, from Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel's point of view in terms of where they are on the timeline, most of the dream has to do with the future and some of it has to do with the present. For us, studying this now where we are on the timeline, uh, this dream is mostly history for us. But there is still a future element, even of this, of this dream here in Daniel chapter 2. So don't tune out because not all of this is history. The wonderful thing that we have, the advantage we have, is we're able now to see that, that most of what Daniel said has happened. Some is still to happen. And so we have the advantage of looking back and recognizing history that all the things that God said was going to happen have happened up to this point. So that means that the other aspect of this dream that has yet to occur, even in our lifetime, that's going to happen too. Because you can bank on the fact that if God has been consistently faithful and true all the way up to this point in terms of this dream, he's also going to fulfill the rest of it. So we know what is coming. We have the advantage as Christians of opening up our Bibles and actually getting a glimpse into the future so that we can be aware of these things and prepared for these things. So we're going to be looking backwards in terms of history, but we're also going to be looking a little bit in terms of the future and the prophetic element that is in this dream as well. And so Daniel starts out by telling Nebuchadnezzar that Nebuchadnezzar's dream, what he saw was a statue, a statue that might have looked something like this. A statue that is described in this dream as having a head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet mixed with iron and clay. And then Daniel also says that as part of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he saw this stone, this rock, not hewn out of, by human hands, but this rock that came out of heaven and then fell on the feet of this statue and crushed it, and subsequently the entire statue ended up crumbling down. And so Daniel presents, that's the overall dream that you have, and now Daniel follows up because he's received inspiration from the Lord as to its interpretation. The dream that God has given Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel interprets is a, a dream that has to do with the rise and the fall of kings and kingdoms, of world empires, starting with his own, starting with Nebuchadnezzar's own empire, the Babylonian Empire. So if you look back here in your Bibles at Daniel 2, again, verse 36, Daniel says to him, this is the dream, and now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, Notice, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. And so Daniel starts with the head of the statue. He's going to work all the way down to the toes. But he starts by saying to Nebuchadnezzar, you are represented by this head of gold in this statue. And I want to point out again in verse 37 that Daniel specifically says, for the God of heaven has given you, Nebuchadnezzar, a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Notice he points out the fact that Nebuchadnezzar would not be in power except for the fact that God has sovereignly chosen him for such a time as this. This pagan, this heathen king, God nevertheless it has raised up to accomplish God's purposes in the world. This is important theology as it relates to the sovereignty of God and even kings and kingdoms of the nations. In Romans 13 verse 1, it tells us that there's no authority given unto us except that which God has established. Government comes from God. And he, he is sovereignly at work directing the affairs of nations. He, rise, he raises up kings, he deposes them. This is Daniel 2.21. That kings rise and kings fall because God removes kings and God raises up kings. In Proverbs 21 verse 1, it says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And like the rivers of water, he, God, turns it wherever he wills. And so God is sovereignly involved in the affairs of men and rulers of nations. And we need to keep this in mind that simply put, God is sovereign over the nations. Even at times, raising up a pagan, ungodly man like Nebuchadnezzar for God's purposes, to accomplish 
uh, his purposes in the earth for his timing. You know, the Bible even specifically says about Nebuchadnezzar, 1 Chronicles 6.15, it says, The Lord carried Judah and Jerusalem into captivity by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And in Jeremiah 25, verse 9, God refers to Nebuchadnezzar as my servant. So, this is important for us to realize overall, because what was true for Nebuchadnezzar in his day is true for the kings and kingdoms of our day. Meaning that even, for example, in a democracy or in the case of a republic like ours, where people get a chance to vote, uh, God can still move the hearts of men and women to vote in a way to accomplish his purposes. Now, here's why this is important to understand, because it, you're going to get your underwear all tied up in a knot every time you think that your person got elected or your person didn't get elected, all right? We need to rest in the fact that God sovereignly is involved in, in the nations, and he r raises up kings, and he removes them, all right? It's all in the hand of God. So there are times when there might be some pagan king, and there are sometimes there might be some godly king. Either way, God's going to accomplish his purposes through either person. You know, we don't need to get all bent out of shape and all worked up about, you know, what we do or don't like. God, God, is, God is in charge of things, okay? And, and frankly, when you look at the way that God used pagan kings like Nebuchadnezzar, and Cyrus, who follows, eventually follows Nebuchadnezzar, and how both Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus were favorably disposed towards the Jews and did things that helped them and benefited them, quite honestly, listen, I would rather have, as far as it relates to us, I would rather have a president that doesn't necessarily claim to know the Lord, but God uses him to be favorably disposed to Christians and to espouse Christian values and biblical truths in our land than any president who might say that he's a Christian, but yet the social policies are anti-God, anti-family, anti-life. You see what I'm saying? God is going to direct and God is going to be involved and God is sovereign in ways that we can rest in that and trust him and put our confidence in the one who is seated on a throne in heaven and not whoever occupies the White House. Don't get wigged out about that, all right? Just don't get wigged out about that. And so Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, you're in power because God has allowed it. God has chosen you for such a time as this. God has given you a throne. He's raised you up and he's made you ruler. So starting from the statue, the head down to the toes, he says, you are that king and Babylon is that kingdom. The Babylonian empire was, uh, roughly lasted 70 years from around 612 BC to 539 BC. It wasn't actually very long. And then God deposed Nebuchadnezzar. Actually, it was, it was his grandson by the time that God said the Babylonian empire is done and it had served its purpose. And God wanted to raise up another king who would be again favorably disposed to the Jews to let him go back home, which brings us to the next kingdom. You move down the statue from the head of gold, you come now to chest and arms of silver, as verse 32 tells us. And in verse 39, if you look again in your Bibles, verse 39, he says, but after you, Nebuchadnezzar, shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Please notice that the materials of the statue become inferior the more you go from head to toe. We start with a head of gold. We move now to chest and arms of silver, which represent the Persian Empire. But notice that there are two arms on this statue, and that fits historically, because for a time there was the co-regency with the Medes and the Persians. So the next thing that we have the advantage of history, now looking backwards, we can see what Daniel was saying moving forwards, but historically we know that the empire of the Medes and Persians, the Medo-Persian empire, lasted from around 539 BC to 331 BC. Following them, Daniel says at the end of verse 39, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth, is gonna come. And so we move now to the belly and thighs of bronze that follow the Medo-Persian Empire. And he speaks of what would end up being, we now know historically, the Greek Empire. The Greek Empire lasted from roughly 331 BC to 168 BC and enters Alexander the Great. Now Daniel prophesies about Alexander the Great 200 years before he's born. 
He does not mention him by name, but Daniel is clear in the description. We know now that what he, who, the person he's referring to was none other than Alexander the Great, because later, and we'll get to it more in Daniel chapter 8. In Daniel chapter 8, Daniel talks about the king who rises from this third kingdom, who has no successors. Now, Alexander the Great died at the age of 33 with no successors. He actually ended up dying in Babylon, believe it or not. And when he had no successors, the Greek empire under Alexander the Great was divided among his four generals, which is exactly what Daniel said would happen, that there would arise a king from the third empire, from the third kingdom who had no successors and that his kingdom would be divided into four parts. So again, you know, we have this beautiful vantage point of looking at, at, at what was then biblical prophecy, seeing how it's been fulfilled, recognizing, listen, what does this mean? What this means is, again, it's just more credibility to the fact that God is sovereign, and God is true, and God is just, and He will accomplish His purposes. And we see these things unraveling as Daniel said they would, just as they would. And so, then he moves on to the fourth kingdom in verse 40. And he says that the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. And so, we, we know from history, right? What follows the Greek empire? The Romans. The Romans come into power and they are a ruthless people. They are like iron, just breaking other countries apart, taking power, roughly 168 BC to 476 AD. It's interesting that iron is used in this, in this vision and the most prestigious legion of the Roman army was the sixth legion which was also known in Latin as the Legio Sexta Ferrata, which translates the Sixth Iron Legion, because their shields and helmets were all made of iron. So it's very interesting. You know, Daniel sees way down, even calls out the element here that's going to typify this kingdom. And what's also interesting is, is that Rome here, you know, symbolized by these two iron legs, the Roman Empire does become divided into two legs. Uh, we know from history in 286 AD, two empires would emerge from the Roman Empire and Rome would end up being the capital of the Western Roman Empire, otherwise known as the Holy Roman Empire. And then the Eastern Roman Empire would be known as the Byzantine Empire with the capital in Constantinople, which is today Istanbul. And so we, we see the division now historically, understanding what Daniel was prophesying about. And the Roman Empire uh, would end up being the last world-dominating empire. Historically speaking, the last world-dominating empire. Other people tried to dominate the world, Genghis Khan, uh, Stalin, Hitler, Napoleon, but nobody was ever successful. The Roman Empire has been the last world-dominating empire. However, this is where we move from history to prophecy now. Daniel sees feet of clay and iron mixed. And he talks about a fifth empire, a fifth kingdom that is going to happen. And this is where it's important for us to realize things that are still to come, folks. Uh, this fifth empire is represented by the feet and toes that are a mixture of iron and clay, meaning it's brittle. From verses 41 to 43, he talks about it. I'm not going to reread the verses. But Daniel talks about this kingdom that is inferior. It is brittle in the sense that it only lasts for a short amount of time. But it brings us to the fifth world empire that will dominate the world just prior to the return of Christ. And this fifth dominating empire represented by feet of clay and iron and specifically the ten toes indicate to us that there is coming a fifth dominating empire that will be known as a ten-nation confederation. A ten-nation confederation. Now, John also sees this in Revelation chapter 17. But instead of seeing ten toes, he sees ten horns on top of the heads of seven beasts. And he writes in Revelation uh, chapter 17 that this ten-nation confederation will end up giving their power to one among them, otherwise known as the beast, otherwise known as the Antichrist. So friends, this is what the Bible predicts about the future. Now, I don't know how this ten-block confederation will occur. 
Uh, perhaps it will be that in the future, our globe will be divided into 10 geographical regions, and each region then will end up dominating the world. It could be that there will be a conglomeration of nations that will form some kind of uh, federation, uh, similar to the way right now the European Union has 28 nations, which, by the way, are starting to peel away. The EU is becoming weaker. Um, and so maybe it's some conglomeration. Maybe it is uh, a reference to the UN Security Council that will end up giving some kind of uh, universal control. Right now there are 15 members of the UN Security Council. The United States is part of the five that are permanent, 10 that are voted on every two years. The uh, bottom line is we don't know how these nations will form, but it is clear in Scripture that there will rise a kingdom of 10 nations, some kind of confederation of 10, that will dominate and rule the world. And again, out of one of those will arise the Antichrist. This is what John says in Revelation chapter 17. And they, meaning the 10 nation confederation, will give their power and authority to the beast. And these will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them. That's Jesus will overcome them for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Now notice that those who are with Jesus, Jesus is going to come again. He's going to put an end to this 10 nation confederation to the antichrist. It'll culminate in the battle of Armageddon. We talked about this. Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom on earth forever and ever. And, and so this is, this is what will happen. And this answers the question, where will we be? Because here in Revelation 17, it says that the called faithful and chosen ones will come with the Lord. So if you know Christ, by the time this happens, you will either be in heaven because you've died and gone to heaven, or you will be in heaven because you've been raptured with the church and therefore you're kept in heaven. And then you return with the Lord when he returns. But when he comes, he's gonna establish his kingdom on earth and he will overthrow these kingdoms that have been dominating the world, which is the last part of this vision. Because Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar, you also saw this stone, this rock coming out of heaven, not hewn by human hands. And it crushed the toes, the feet of the statue. And then the whole thing came crumbling down. Listen, that rock is none other than Jesus Christ. It is a vision in the Old Testament of the return of Christ to dominate the world once and for all. And then Daniel says here that when the rock comes, when the rock returns in verse 44, and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It's not a humanly run thing. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. The kingdom of our Lord will never perish. It will never end. In fact, Gabriel the angel, when he announced to Mary that she had conceived of the Messiah, Gabriel said in Luke 1.33, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Daniel also says here in chapter 2, verse 35, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Uh, this is similar to what Habakkuk wrote in Habakkuk 2.14 when he said, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And when Daniel had said all this, Nebuchadnezzar, here's your dream. Here's what it means. It's going to be the rise and fall of kingdom after kingdom after kingdom until finally there's going to be one kingdom that stands forever and ever. Then Nebuchadnezzar gave praise to the God of heaven in chapter 2, verse 47. He said, truly, your God, Daniel, is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Here's, here's the takeaway in all this. Listen, the Babylonian kingdom has come and gone. The Medo-Persian kingdom has come and gone. The Greeks, the Romans have come and gone. There will be a fifth world power that will rise. Out of that will come the Antichrist. And then our Lord shall return. And he will establish his kingdom forever and ever. And so we shall be with him. So give praise to God who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the soon and coming King again.
Isaiah the prophet looked to this day in Isaiah 9. It usually adorns our Christmas cards, but it really is speaking of the eternal reign of our Lord when it says this, and the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you have given us a glimpse into the future. You've confirmed your word in the past. And we know, Lord, that we can rest confidently that those things that are still to happen will happen just as Daniel prophesied things in the future that we can now look back and see have indeed happened. We look forward to your return, the day that the rock shall come and crush all other nations, and you shall establish yourself forever and ever as King and Lord. And thank you, Father, for the hope that we have as the church looking forward to your imminent return. We love you and we praise you together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you all.